The Mediterranean diet is probably the most well-rounded diet. In this video, we're gonna break down the 10 reasons why that is the case, but I'm also gonna give you practical pieces that you can apply so you can get the most benefit of these 10 reasons. So let's go ahead and let's just jump right in. The first thing with the Mediterranean diet is it's downright tasty. Now this doesn't sound like super scientific stuff, and it doesn't need to be. The reality is, is that if you want to be able to do something for a long time, you need to enjoy it. And when you look at eating whole foods and wholesome foods all together, at first it doesn't sound all that good because we're not really exposed to wholesome foods all that often. But with the Mediterranean diet, you have a lot of these very powerful spices that, by the way, are doing extremely cool biochemical things in our body that are one of the reasons the Mediterranean diet is so great in the first place, but it also tastes phenomenal. So oregano, rosemary, thyme, all of these trigger the body to utilize fats more effectively, but they also make things taste really good. Also using things like olive oil, avocado oil, all these oils have a rich flavor. Whereas if you look at like conventional soybean oil and other crap like that, well, that doesn't have much flavor. So you end up having to add all kinds of other stuff to make it taste good. Additionally, the veggies are not usually eaten in like some bland, boring form. Most of the veggies are made into stews or soups or whatever. So you're getting all these veggies in without even realizing you're getting veggies in. So as far as a, like a satiety factor and a satisfaction factor, that's why I list that as number one. It's probably the most important thing because you can adhere to it once you start it. Number two is going to be the microbiome. Now with the microbiome, it's so easy to get lost in the weeds of the microbiome. But there's a couple very important things we have to focus on here. As we get older, the junctions in our gut start to separate, okay? And these junctions that separate, what happens is we have specific bacteria that produce what are called sulfates. And when these sulfates are produced by sort of bad bacteria, it makes these junctions even bigger and larger. Well, what happens when we have these junctions? When we have these junctions, pathogenic material that is in our gut leaks through the gut wall and it triggers inflammation. It's not like you just have immediate poison going into the body. It's a longer process where the body starts to produce more inflammation as a result to dealing with what's leaking through. Inflammation, that's our joint pain, that's our headaches, that's our brain fog, that's our general aging at a cellular and a much more physical, mechanical level. So what happens is when you have a high diversity of foods that come through with a Mediterranean diet, high amounts of fiber, things like artichokes, things like asparagus, which you should be adding into your diet whether you're doing Mediterranean or not, these produce a fermentation process that allows the cells within the gut to literally get energy from that fermentation process. So when those cells are energized, they essentially have the energy to form these tighter junctions, making the gut a more hermetically sealed environment like it should be. So what you can do to your diet is you can add more asparagus in, add more artichokes in. You want fibers that have high amounts of inulin and fibers that are high in the soluble fiber content. So as far as the veggies are concerned, so the prebiotic foods like onions, like garlic, like shallots, okay, and then obviously the prebiotic fibers that you're gonna get from artichokes and from inulin and things like that. Add those into your diet as much as you possibly can. But then we move into number three. Okay, number three still has to do with the microbiome, and we're talking about satiety. Now, why is the Mediterranean diet so powerful for satiety? Well, for one, you're probably getting a lot of just abundance of different foods and you feel just like mentally satiated. But when you look at the gut microbiome, once again, we find some interesting stuff. Maybe you've heard about semaglutide before, or ozempic, or a glucagon-like peptide one receptor agonist. We're, we're talking about them all over the place now because they're popular. They're these weight loss drugs that people are using. And what they do is they basically reduce hunger and they essentially allow the pancreas to produce more insulin. So we see it talked about all the time, but a diverse microbiome actually produces a lot of GLP-1. So when you eat a lot of fibers and you're eating like this Mediterranean style diet, you produce more of what is called butyrate. Butyrate is a byproduct of the fibers being broken down. And this butyrate is really unique because this butyrate signals GLP-1 to spike. GLP-1 is a messenger between the gut and the brain. So GLP-1 recognizes when there's food and recognizes when you have enough food and it sends a signal to the brain to start the cascade of digestive processes and absorptive processes. In most people that are metabolically dysfunctional, this process is disrupted. 
So by adding more fibers in and eating the diversity of foods that you get in a Mediterranean diet, you produce more of this GLP-1 being significantly more satiated, almost like you're taking semaglutide or Ozempic. There's a meta-analysis that took a look at 28 studies, 28 studies, and they found that of those 28 studies, all of them showed increases in glucagon-like peptide 1 when there was greater adherence to a Mediterranean diet. That is a lot of data, a lot of objective and observational data that shows us some pretty solid proof in the pudding that it's good for satiety. Now additionally, there's some studies that demonstrate that you have increases in PYY and CCK, which are other gut incretins that send signals to the brain. So it seems as though the microbiome seems to be playing a large benefit here. But then there's even more that we have to look at, which we'll talk about in a second. Now, if you're first starting a Mediterranean diet, what I would recommend is that you really kind of introduce these foods slowly, okay? Because sometimes a lot of fiber coming in at first can be a little bit rough on the gut. So kind of introduce them slowly. Okay, the next thing is going to be insulin resistance. You would think that insulin resistance would be the biggest piece that I'd talk about with the Mediterranean diet. However, with insulin resistance, it is solved as sort of a byproduct or a secondary factor with these other things that happen. So remember that GLP-1 that we were talking about. Well, when GLP-1 is increased, it triggers the pancreas to produce more insulin. Now, that sounds bad, right? Why would you want more insulin? Isn't insulin bad? No, insulin is bad when it doesn't actually do anything, when you're just producing copious amounts of it with no response. When you trigger the pancreas to produce more insulin, you have a greater likelihood of that glucose getting into the cell properly. Okay, so this whole microbiome piece that we're talking about and improving the ability to allow the body to use glucose, this is tremendous across the board. Now, additionally, with the Mediterranean diet, you've got a lot of foods that are rich in quercetin. You've got capers, you've got onions, you've got shallots, the list goes on and on. You could literally Google foods high in quercetin. Quercetin increases AMPK in the skeletal muscle cell. What this means is that it increases the ability of the muscle to suck up glucose without insulin being present. This means that the body soaks up that glucose and doesn't have to produce insulin as a response to it. So that gives your body a chance to sort of recharge and refill its insulin reserves in some ways. That's a very colloquial way of putting it, but essentially you soak up glucose without insulin being present. This is huge. Now also the different kinds of fats that you have in the Mediterranean diet, the monounsaturated fats. So you've got the things like the olive oil. Okay, you've got uh, oleic acid that you're gonna find in olive oil. You've got other monounsaturated fats like omega-7s, which are unique to very specific fats. In this case, like macadamia nuts. Macadamia nuts may not be considered the most Mediterranean food by region, but as far as nutrient profile, they're about as Mediterranean as it gets. Super low omega-6, high omega-3, and high omega-7. The research is starting to demonstrate that omega-7s improve insulin sensitivity via multiple different mechanisms, by allowing the pancreas to produce more insulin, but also by increasing that cell fluidity that allows glucose to actually get into the cell better. So anytime you add these monounsaturated fats, you've got a lot of data backing it up. So how can you add monounsaturated fats? We've already talked about the fibers. Okay, the olive oil, the avocado oils, don't forget to just eat straight up olives. Like people like throw those by the wayside. They just think olives and olive oil and that's it. No, get the olives, eat the whole thing. You get the hydroxytyrosol and the antioxidants there too. Uh, straight up avocados, eat the whole thing. Macadamia nuts. Remember, it doesn't have to be from the region of a Mediterranean style thing. Like it can be those same types of foods. So some Brazil nuts, some almonds, some cashews to a small degree, but macadamia nuts probably being the best. I popped a link down below for House of Macadamia, which is arguably the best macadamia nut source if you ask me. So they harvest and grow everything in South Africa and then they package it less than an hour's drive from where it's harvested. So that link down below saves you 20% off your entire order through them. So you can get 20% off everything, but you also get a free 20 ounce bottle of their cold pressed macadamia nut oil. So seriously a good deal. So they've got straight up macadamia nuts, they've got the onion flavor, they've got regular roasted salted, they've got salsa flavor, the list goes on and on. But then they also have these delicious macadamia nut bars that really rival a kind bar, but without the sugar. So the first ingredient is macadamia nuts. These things are amazing. And then you've got that macadamia nut oil, which is cold pressed, the only cold pressed macadamia nut oil you're gonna find. So that link down below gets you 20% off and that free 20 ounce bottle. So definitely check them out down below, top line of the description. Number five is that visceral fat. That is the fat that is underneath the subcutaneous fat. Then what gives you that pot belly? It's the fat that surrounds the organs and it's the most dangerous fat because that is the fat that is truly inflammatory. 
What happens is this visceral fat produces what are called resistins. This is a relatively new science, but these resistins, just like the name implies, lead to insulin resistance by increasing inflammation in the body, specifically in a metabolic sphere that increases insulin resistance. So one of the best ways that you can combat insulin resistance is by reducing visceral fat, but it's a double-edged sword because you kind of have to, like a which came first, the chicken or the egg kind of thing. Well, there was a study published in the journal Clinical Nutrition that found that once again, higher adherence to a Mediterranean diet led to quick reductions in visceral fat. Probably has to do with the mono and the polyunsaturated fats, also has to do with the lower glycemic carbs, but also the polyphenols that can combat the inflammatory response that you might get otherwise. As a matter of fact, the British Medical Journal had published a paper that demonstrated that higher polyphenol content with the diet led to lower levels of visceral fat. Now this is a complicated equation that we don't need to go into too much detail in this video, but what does this really look like? Like how can you increase your polyphenol content? Okay, bottom line is really simple. The darker the colored berry, the higher the polyphenol content. Okay, so typically you wanna go for dark blueberries, you wanna go for wild blueberries, the little small ones. You wanna go for raspberries, you wanna go for strawberries. The berries have a lower glycemic index, so you have more bang for the buck. So always opt for those whenever you can. Now, as far as other polyphenols, apples are also very rich in polyphenols that seem to be quite good for insulin resistance. You look at an apple and you think, this is super sweet, this is insanely sugary, how could this be good? Well, first of all, if it's an organic apple and it's not some genetically modified BS, it's not gonna be as crazy sweet, but also a lot of that power is in the skin. So when you eat an apple, try to get the skin. That's the part that has the polyphenols and the antioxidants and sometimes these other fruits and vegetables. You gotta eat the skin to get those carotenoids that give you that benefit. So it's crazy that even though visceral fat seems like something that's purely metabolic and you have to go work out and work your butt off to burn it, simply adding certain foods could actually be beneficial. Number six, is how it improves your mood. Now, this isn't just some indirect thing. There's actually very interesting data where they looked at functional MRIs, where they looked at people's brains under MRI, and they found that this, the microbiome produces something called endoxyl sulfate. And when endoxyl sulfate is produced by the microbiome, it tilts the brain towards a much more nervous, anxiety-driven state. So when people have a bad microbiome and it's unbalanced, they tend to be more anxious, more moody, more nervous, more depressed. So there's some evidence that suggests that a Mediterranean diet reduces the bacteria that produce this endoxyl sulfate. As a matter of fact, there was a study that was published in Nutritional Neuroscience that took a look at 158 people for 12 weeks as an intervention with a Mediterranean diet. They found that it improved their mood, decreased their depressive symptomology, decreased anxiety, overall put them in a better mood state. So we have all this data stacking up in favor of the Mediterranean diet. Is it reductions in inflammation? Yes, probably. Is it improved insulin sensitivity and improving the you know, glucose hypometabolism in the brain? Yes, probably. Does it all stem from the fats in the microbiome? More than likely, it probably does. But let's kind of dovetail this nicely into number seven, which is the improvement in cognitive function. Mediterranean diet is seen to be one of the most powerful diets for cognitive function. The only other diet that might be better for cognitive is going to be a low-carb ketogenic diet. But the interesting thing is, is if you want the best of both worlds, you can do a low carb ketogenic diet with a Mediterranean flair. So the only thing that's happening is you're using all Mediterranean principles. The fats are the same, the olive oil, the avocado oil, the macadamia nuts, the proteins are the same, the lean meats, the lean beef, things like that. All that's the same. You're just 86ing some of the fruit and you're 86ing some of the lentils and some of the grains and some of the things like that. So you're having small amounts of berries, you're just eating everything else Mediterranean. Now with cognition and cognitive function, insulin sensitivity seems to be playing a big role here. So as we get older and we develop more insulin resistance, we see a sort of line item correlation there with worse cognitive function. So there's something kind of metabolic happening there. There was a study published in Epidemiology that took a look at 12 trials with the Mediterranean diet. Nine out of 12 of those trials with the Mediterranean diet saw huge improvements in not only cognitive function, like it didn't just help their brain, but also reduced significantly the instances of neurodegenerative conditions, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, things like that. So we have a huge protective mechanism, but for those of us that are living in the short term, we also get a nice cognitive boost as well. What's interesting is there was a study published in the journal Neurology as well that found that the greater the adherence to a Mediterranean diet, the greater they were able to stave off Alzheimer's dementia. So the more they adhered, there was a one and a half to three and a half year sort of delay in any onset of symptoms. Doesn't sound like much, but by just sort of 
applying some Mediterranean principles, not even doing full-blown Mediterranean, just applying some principles, really have this huge benefit in staving off cognitive, this cognitive decline, which is huge. But then we move into this next one, which is also huge for people that are just trying to live their life normally, and that's our reproductive function. So there are some benefits with the Mediterranean diet and overall testosterone function. There's benefits to modulation of estrogen, and that all has to do with the microbiome, because there's huge microbiome benefits to testosterone production and huge microbiome benefits to estrogen metabolism in what is called the estrobilome. Bottom line is we don't need to spend a lot of time talking about that. We've talked about the microbiome a lot. But there was a study published in Human Reproduction that took a look at 255 men, and it found that their sperm quality and rates of fertility went up significantly on a Mediterranean diet. Researchers are speculating this has to do with the fact that sperm has a high DHA content in the membrane. Okay, DHA is docosahexaenoic acid, which is from fish oil. There aren't a lot of diets that have as high of omega-3 levels that the Mediterranean does. So you're not gonna find that unless you're specifically adding it in. But the bottom line here is maybe you don't eat fish. Maybe you can't get those omega-3s in. What we're finding is that for reproductive health in general, if you apply some of the fat profiles in the Mediterranean diet, so again, omega-3s from fish oil, from krill oil, from calamarine oil, from cod liver oil, whatever supplemental form you have to get. Otherwise, from salmon, from things like that, whatever fish sources, sardines, oysters, all that is good but also counterbalancing that with the monounsaturated fats from the olive oil, from the avocado oils, from the macadamia nut oils, and slightly lower saturated fat. So saturated fat might help with cholesterol formation, which can help with sex drive and libido, but when it comes down to actually having efficiency and effectiveness, and also insulin sensitivity that can affect our reproductive system, you want to have these poly and monounsaturated fats. Now this next one is very important, sarcopenia, which is muscle wasting. Now, if you're in your 30s or 40s, you're watching this and you're like, yeah, you know, I just want to be uh, super jacked and I want to have my muscles and I'm not too worried about sarcopenia, I'm more worried about building muscle. Sarcopenia is something I worry about when I'm in my 80s and that's muscle wasting. No, the muscle wasting starts in your 30s. Your body starts breaking down muscle fast and there's a lot of speculation as to why this happens. For one, we're less active, but for two, we have what is called apoptosis. Our cells just start to self-destruct. And when our cells self-destruct, skeletal muscle cells self-destruct as well. So where does the Mediterranean diet come in with this? There's a study published in JCSM that found that the greater the adherence to the Mediterranean diet, the less frailty and the less overall accidents and overall more skeletal muscle mass and durability there was. Now, why is this? I think there's a couple different things here. Uh, some again have speculated it's the high polyphenol content. We are talking a very anti-inflammatory diet a very high polyphenol type diet, even though a traditional Mediterranean diet is relatively low protein, which that's the one place I sort of diverge. I think a Mediterranean diet with more protein, at least for an active person, is quite important. So it's quite interesting to see that even though a traditional Mediterranean diet is lowish protein, it ends up leading to less muscle breakdown. So there's gotta be more going on than just the protein. My philosophy here is it's the polyphenols, it's the carotenoids, it's all kinds of things that help protect the cells from just self-destructing, but it's also the lower levels of inflammation that make you feel more active, that allow you to do what is most important for maintaining muscle, actually working out and using your muscles. If you feel like crap, you're not gonna work out and you're not gonna maintain muscles. If you feel good, you're gonna move around and you're gonna maintain muscle better. So I think sometimes we have to look beyond what is right in front of us or beyond some of this like nitty gritty mechanistic stuff and just look at how much energy we have with a Mediterranean style diet. And the piece we've all been waiting for, it's probably the best when it comes down to longevity. When it comes down to longevity, the Mediterranean diet seems to be where it's at. Enough protein to sustain life. You're not going vegan, you're not going vegetarian. You've got all kinds of different benefits that come in here, microbiome benefits, but let's get more granular. When we start deteriorating at the brain level, it happens before we even realize it. Pathological hypoglucose metabolism or hypometabolism, basically where the brain cannot use glucose as well because it's become impaired and insulin resistant. This clearly leads to neurodegenerative diseases. But this whole pathological process metabolically is happening 10, 20, 30 years before we ever notice any symptoms. So this is happening to you right now and you don't realize it, and you're just not gonna really feel the effects for 30 years. So when we look at the Mediterranean diet and how it impacts the brain, which impacts everything else, 
Insulin sensitivity, insulin resistance is very important because longevity is not just about how long can I make it on my deathbed. It's more about how active and how much vitality can I have in my 80s and even 90s because that's health span, not just lifespan. Now, if we look at some of the data, there's something called line one. And we look at what is called line one methylation as sort of a barometer for our level of methylation globally in the body. Now, what is methylation? We need to have a certain level of methylation uh, to survive. But if we have too much methylation, it's not good either. And it's definitely in the longevity science world that's beyond my pay grade. But there was a study that was published in the journal Genes and Nutrition that found the Mediterranean diet was associated with higher line one methylation which is an indicator that the body has less risk of cancer, less risk of DNA damage. The higher the line one methylation, the better the overall sort of methylation balance is in the body. Now again, that's a fancy way of saying it's potentially best or better for cancer prevention. But what about for actual like aging? Well, this is where things get wild. There was a study published in Gero Science, and it found that subjects that went on a more Mediterranean style diet, even as an intervention for one year, ended up having a reversal of their epigenetic age. They actually went backwards in biological age based upon the Horvath score. So that means one year of Polish participants ended up going on a Mediterranean diet, and in one year, it reversed. They went backwards in age as far as an epigenetic clock is concerned. It literally rejuvenated their epigenetic age. So this is very like speculative when you start like breaking it down like this. It's purely hypothetical when I say this. But if you're 60 years old and your biological age is 60 and your chronological age is 60, you're right in balance, right? But if you went on a Mediterranean diet, your biological age could go down to 50, even though your chronological age is 60. So the Mediterranean diet seems to be very beneficial for this. So again, what is your takeaway from all of this? You don't have to do a specific Mediterranean style diet, but the closer that you adhere to the main principles, the better success you'll have. What are the main principles? diversity of fibers, high amounts of mono and polyunsaturated fats and lower amounts of saturated fat, high amounts of lean protein, not super fatty cuts of meat, leaner protein is always going to be better, high polyphenol rich foods, whether that's fruits, whether that's vegetables, I don't really care. And those are really the hallmarks there. With that, you apply those, and it kind of just sounds like eating close to the earth, even if it's not Mediterranean. As always, I'll see you tomorrow.